All right. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our seminar, our summer seminar series. Um, today, we're excited to have Ryan Haynes, a, a local biologist, with us to discuss um, to discuss uh, limnology and uh, why that is important to you when you're looking to improve your fishing. So, Ryan. Thank you so much for joining us and I will turn it over to you. Oh, I should say, I guess we will have everybody remain on mute and um, we will unmute at the end for any questions or comments that you might have. So Ryan. Okay, great. Thank you, Heather. Um, and I'd just like to yeah, thank Heather and, and Sudero of Nestor Falls for continuing on with the seminar series through the difficult times and finding a way to, to make it happen. I think it's been, been great. Um, as I, as I mentioned to Heather, for those who joined previously, I won't have uh, quite as many camera angles as, as uh, Bruce Berenger did for his jig presentation. We'll put more of a standard format here, but hopefully you enjoy it. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, I grew, grew up in the Kenora area, um, but unlike a lot of passionate anglers, I, I did not actually like angling as, as, a, as a youth. Um, really didn't come into enjoying angling when I could tell I was about 18 years old and started to really, once I figured out that angling wasn't just about um, luck and that there was actually uh, a game to be played in terms of figuring the fish out and stuff that really captured my imagination and been pretty passionate about fishing and it's been a big part of my life ever, ever since. Um, while I was going to school, uh, and getting my degree in, in fisheries management from the University of Northern British Columbia back um, for 20 years ago now. Um, I was guided um, on Lake of the Woods. I guided uh, for a number of years at, on the Gray Sand, um, Center Island, down, down near the Oak Island, Minnesota border. Did some guiding there, um, as well as for uh, Jack Nethercutt. Got a lodge on Portage Lodge. So I spent a lot of time guiding on Lake of the Woods and for about 10 years, I um, had my own brand, my own guide service, like the Woods Experience Guide Service, um, until about five years ago, and, and my kind of consulting business has got really busy, that and, and a young family, and then I just kind of um, focused more on, on that part of my business. So hopefully this presentation can help bring kind of some of the things I've observed as, as an angler, as well as someone with a, a science background. Um, and something that I, I think is, is important for anglers to, to understand is about limnology um, and kind of how lakes function, because obviously that, that's um, where, where fish live and, and what's going on in, in our waters and lakes is, is, can really um, influences where, where, where fish can be found, which can help anglers catch, catch more fish. So this next slide, I, I won't go through and read all this, but basically, Limnology almost is to freshwater what oceanography is to saltwater. Basically, limnology, if there's anything biological, chemical, physical, um, that you're looking at the study of any freshwater lakes, rivers, ponds, that it's, it's covered under limnology. Um, I'm not going to go through all of those things today. I think we're really just going to focus on um, temperature and like thermal stratification. People will talk about, you know, the thermocline. Um, and how lakes thermally stratify in, in this area of, of, of the world and, and how that impacts uh, fish, fish behavior. Um, so we'll start off by just talking about water temperature in lakes um, and then also how the water temperature affects fish. Um, and then zooplankton and, and what zooplankton do relative to those temperature changes and, and how that influences where fish are go, go to feed. Um, and then talk a little bit about the weeds, which kind of is, is the exception to a lot of the things I'm going to talk about, thermal stratification and how fish move deeper and stuff. Weeds are kind of an outlier there and just a little bit about why that happens. And then some impacts of uh, climate change and, and global warming and how that um, impacts some of the, the especially cold water fish species we, we have in this, in this area. So the... the thing that really influences thermal stratification in, in our lakes is the fact that the water is most dense at four degrees Celsius. So it is less dense as a solid than it is as a liquid. And this is 
is actually pretty rare for substances. Um, we're, we're very fortunate because if water was like most substances and it was actually more dense as a solid, our lakes would freeze top to bottom every winter and then life as we know it in our lakes would, would, would not be possible. Um, I mean, it's not unique. I think there's other uh, acetic acid and elements like gallium, germanium, silicon also have this characteristic where they're less dense as a solid. It just has to do with the crystal structure of water as it forms into ice that causes the ice to actually be less dense than water when it is at, at four degrees Celsius. Um, so that's the, the one thing that really influences uh, the temperature regime of, of our lakes throughout, throughout the seasons. Um, and the other big thing with temperature is, is I'm sure everyone's aware, fish, fish have no, no control of, over their body temperature. Um, so they are really at the mercy of the water they swim in. Um, which has serious well, impacts on, on their metabolism. So their metabolism rates um, speed up with warmer waters and it's there. They all have their own ideal temperatures that they've evolved to, to function in. And that affects where, where fish can be found based on different uh, water temperatures in, in, in the lakes. So with that, there's, this is um, looking at um, how lakes stratify throughout the year. And I think for this example, I'll just start at, at the bottom right corner. Um, there you, you've got your ice, which for the winter months, we've got ice on the top again, because it's less dense than, than water. So it floats on the top. And then because that ice has been um, influencing the, the surficial water rate right below the ice, that, that water tends to be about zero degrees Celsius. And then as mentioned, um, most of the water column will be four degrees Celsius because that is water at its densest. And in the fall, as we'll get to right before the ice forms, the water is pretty much four degrees Celsius from top to bottom. Then, then the spring, there's, there's a spring turnover, which, which is re really short lived um, when, when compared to fall turnover, just because what ha happens is, is as soon as the surface waters Basically, you get that little patch that's zero degrees Celsius. And once that warms to four degrees Celsius, then the whole water column will again be four degrees Celsius. And as waters, the surface waters warm, they will stay on the surface of, uh, of the lake. So you start to get warmer waters at the surface. As, as anyone knows who's gone swimming in June and the, the deep dive, you, you can feel that that layer, and, and that's because the, the warmer water is, is less dense and just kind of floats on top of the denser water that, that's beneath it. So what, what happens in, in the summer um, is, you go to the top left corner, is all of a sudden you get a case where there, there's such a, a big difference. As the water warms and warms more and more, it, it's less, much less dense than the water beneath it. And this is where you get thermal stratification of the lakes. So you get the epilimnion, which is, is the surface area that's influenced by wind, and that tends to have fairly like warmer temperatures. And then you get the metalimnion, which is the, the barrier between the surface layer and the layer underneath. And this often we refer to as, as the thermocline. I think that the formal de definition of thermocline is more than a one degree Celsius drop and change in temperature over one meter. Um, it's kind of the, the definition they use, but it's really, and what happens is, is as this sets up and, and you get this thermocline set up, there, there is, as shown in, in the image here, the, the two don't mix. So that this has some real um, implications in terms of, so in, in the bottom of the lake, the hypolimnion, because it doesn't mix, it doesn't have any more sources of oxygen for, for those summer months. And so once the thermocline establishes, you've got the hypolimnion and that the oxygen that it has in there at that time after spring turnover, it has to make use of that oxygen and doesn't have new sources typically until you get into fall turnover. So fish that inhabit these cooler waters are, are really um, limited um, in terms of their oxygen availability, whereas in the epilimnion, you've got wind and wave action and air from the atmosphere that uh, provides oxygen and oxygenates the... So that, that's an important thing to remember. You've got... Um, and then the metalimnion is, is that change in temperature that provides that barrier where there isn't much mixing between the two. 
And then in the fall, when we get um, water start to cool, what happens is, is as the surface waters cool, that cooler water will sink, remembering that it's the cooler the water, the closer it gets to four degrees Celsius, the, the more dense it is. So as the water is cool, they, it sinks. And then that results in, in a mixing of the waters. Um, sometimes people will talk about a smell. And sometimes you get in the, the hypolimnion, if, if you get really anoxic conditions, it's really starved for oxygen, you'll get a smell like almost a sulfuric smell in some back bays and stuff that, that are deeper. Um, and you get this smell as those waters mix and, and come up to, to, to the surface. So the fall turnover and you get your fall winds, which help facilitate this. But then you get, um, once the waters later in the fall, cool so that it's four degrees Celsius top to bottom, then you'll start, your surface waters will start to cool even more than that. And then you get your ice layer forming over top of the lake. So this is our, um, it's called, um, this is our, Two turnovers a year and then this is very typical of, of most lakes in in northwestern Ontario is we'll, we'll go through uh, with, with these two two turnovers every every year. So what does that mean for fish? Um, and this is just a, a chart taken and it's got some species found in this area some that aren't but it just shows that there are ranges for, for fish. I think this is a pretty generous range and shows how fish could be pretty diverse. Um, just remembering that it says here, like the, the two things that um, the fish really need is they need water that's, they're designed to be the ideal temperature because what happens is if fish end up in water warmer than what their digestive systems and their metabolisms are designed for, they start to burn through too much energy. And as a result, they can't put on the weight they need to effectively re re reproduce. Um, and so I mean, the middle of these ranges shown is kind of where fish are performing optimally. And if they get in water that's too cold, then their body slows down too much and they're not able to digest things quickly enough to convert it to energy. So they have, they all have their, their, their sweet spot. Um, and so that's just something important to, to keep in mind. I mean, you can see in here that um, some of our introduced species from, from the south that are at the northern end of their ranges, you can see like largemouth bass and crappie, they, they really can't get water warm enough for them around here. Whereas you look at some species like lake trout, you can see that um, summer months are going to be a little tough for them and they're going to want to seek out that, that deeper water. Um, yeah, and so that's just something that to keep in mind, it definitely affects where fish are. And, and the other thing is, is with that, these fish have evolved to survive with different oxygen contents in the water. And the warmer water is, the less oxygen it can hold, all other things being equal. So, um, and so basically cooler water has a saturation point with more oxygen. So if, um, even if you were to put a bubbler in cooler water, I mean, as everyone knows with minnows, even if they're near the surface and you leave them in too warm a water, they'll, they'll die. And that, that's often due to a lack of sufficient oxygen in, in that water. Whereas cooler water will hold more oxygen and give them that uh, able to survive. Um, so that's the balancing act too, is, is not just the digestive systems and, and the metabolism, but also oxygen levels that, that they require. So this, this creates, I think, some pretty interesting interactions. Um, this is something I've, I've observed in, in, in our, our lakes around here, is, is you look at um, fish species and temperature. So Cisco um, or Tulabi, as they're often called, will have an ideal temperature between eight degrees Celsius and 17 degrees Celsius. You can see they're very much a cool water fish. These are also a very important food source for lake trout. Um, lots of overlapping habitats and a really important open water food source for, for lake trout throughout the year. Um, crappie, you can see they're kind of an introduced species at the northern end of the range. They're looking for waters that are probably about as warm as our, our waters get. They're always seeking out warmer water through, throughout the year. Um, one of the things that, that um, I've observed in, in, our, in our lakes that, that I think is, is really hinges on, on this relationship between Cisco and, and crappie is in, in areas where there, there's a deep basin. Um, think about areas like, like Whitefish Bay, um, west of um, Kenora, like Clearwater Bay area. 
um, black sturgeon lakes. You've got these deeper basins um, where um, cisco are going to thrive in, in the deeper basins. You've got deep basins with lots of oxygen, lot, lots of cool water throughout the summer habitat. And what I've found is, is in, in areas like that, your, your crappies tend to overwinter in um, and spend a lot of their time in back bays that are really isolated from these open water habitats. Um, and I think this, I mean, my theory, is it, it, it seems like any, any time crappie will need to compete with ciscos or in those deep water basins, and whether it's because with those ciscos comes a lot of big predators, whether it's pike or muskie or um, lake trout that'll be chasing them around. But in, in those areas, crappie tend to be in your back bays in those deep, you know, those 30 to or even 25 to 40 foot holes that are isolated from, from the main basin. Um, whereas if, if, if you get in areas um, of like lakes and areas where the um, basin is not deep enough to really support really strong populations of Cisco and, and the predators that, that accompany them, like think about places like Sabascong Bay, um, you get Western Lake of the Woods, like Outer Bay, um, towards Monument Bay, that area that, that the crappie will inhabit the main basin areas. They're not limited to those back bays. And, and this is, I think, really a, a function of, of temperature and where the ciscos aren't able to thrive in, in those deep basins. It provides opportunity for crappies to act more like, like a uh, main basin fish and be out on those main lake points. Whereas you'll find that if you know, that their interaction with the cisco and crappie, that, that'll force um, the crappie or they'll, they'll move and be more likely to be found in, in those, those back bays isolated from that competition. So just kind of interesting interactions that are resulted to this is kind of an extreme example. And, and this plays out in, in a lot of different ways, even if you look at smallmouth bass and largemouth bass and, and their habits, it's very subtle differences. Like they're not great, the differences in, in their preferred temperatures, but you'll find largemouth bass and smallmouth bass um, in, in very different habitats, especially in, in, in midsummer, for, for that reason. It's those, the temperature for their metabolism and, and oxygen re requirements. So the, the other thing that really impacts fish behavior, and, and this gets into when we're looking at um, walleye, when people fish humps on walleye and, and you look at the depth, you find the fish at. Um, not only does lake temperature play a really big factor in this, but how that affects zooplankton is, is a big determining factor. Um, zoo, zooplankton are, for those who don't know, they're, they're, you can barely see them with, with the naked eye, and they're really a, a huge part of our, our food system. They're right kind of at the bottom of the food chain, and then most small fish um, will be feeding on, on these fish as a significant part of their diet. Um, and then with the small fish come the bigger fish chasing the, 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 the larger, larger fish. Um, so the, the zooplankton, they, they feed on algae in, in the photic zone. And so when we talk about photic zone, that, that's the um, depth that light will penetrate in, into the water column. So it, it's the, the photic zone will, will differ depending on like a place like Whitefish Bay will have a deeper photic zone than say Sabascong Bay with, um, with the water clarity. Um, but what the zooplankton do is they want to feed on this algae, but they also don't want to be exposed to predators during the daylight hours. So amazingly enough, these, these little critters will actually swim all the way up the water column and eat in the morning, they'll drop again in the water column. But they do this to avoid predators and still be, be able to feed. But because of the lack of oxygen in midsummer in the um, hypolimnia on that lower level, and I think also with the change in density, that thermocline lack of it can be more difficult to swim up through. But the zooplankton will drop to to the thermocline to that uh, metalimnia on there, and, and they won't go any further than that. And as a result, during the day, that becomes a big part of where your food ends up. So I think people often notice when, when you're fishing humps and you know when they start to set up in July, you'll, you'll start to fish a little shallower. And then as the season goes on, the, you're fishing deeper and deeper in, in the humps. A big part of this is, is how far in the water column the zooplankton are setting up. And sometimes with sonar units, you'll actually pick up on the uh, thermocline 
Um, and often that, that isn't the change in density that your graph's picking up on. That's, that's the band of zooplankton that is set up along, along the thermocline. So you, you can see here, this is just an example of some zooplankton going, you can see starting from the left of the screen, the sun goes down and they go up the water column, feed on algae during the night, and then they drop down again come morning. So it's called dial vertical migration. And then this is um, also why when, when this happens, you'll, you'll get um, in the evening or at night, you'll, you'll see people will catch walleye, catch fish a bit much shallower than they do during the day. And sometimes this is fish coming up, chasing this, you know, kind of this huge food source that, that has moved shallower for, for the evening. So you've got these, these different things going on and you can see here, this is kind of a diagram of on the left, it shows the temperature in, in degrees Celsius. And then on the right, it shows approximately a, a, the, the depth. And so I, I think this is in the depths here, this is very typical of what you would see on Lake of the Woods in, in, the, um, in the summer months. Um, you've got your, you can see your thermocline 10 meters to 15 meters, so about 30 to 40 five feet, you, you get this change in depth or change, change in temperature um, with the mixing happening up above and, and very little mixing down below. So what you end up with is during, during the daylight hours, you get these zooplankton in, in the thermocline and you get walleye who their preferred temperature and oxygen is often near or, or above the thermocline. So they'll, they'll be moving down below into the, the metalindian from above, like to zone two, you'll get walleye and, and other species, cool water species, we call them, will be moving down into the thermocline to feed on, on zooplankton. But you also get other species like cisco and lake trout coming up to feed on them that will be coming up from the bottom. Um, and again, these species are moving up into this metalimnion. It's kind of a, a no man's land where none of them are that comfortable, but they're moving in for feed. But then as soon as they've got full bellies and want to digest, they'll, they'll move back to their, their comfort zone to help make sure that they have uh, the right metabolic rate that, that, that they need. So this is where you kind of the metalimnion is where these cold water species that would be spending most of their time in zone three and your warm water species or your cool water species in zone one, where they would kind of meet for, for feeding for their daylight feeding. Um, and so I, I think maybe your weed fishermen are wondering how, how weeds play into this and, and, and why, like obviously the, at the depths, most of our weeds are found. You're looking at shallower than you know, 10, 12 feet. Um, you don't have a thermocline, you don't have any, you still have very active and, and, and a lot of fish there. Um, maybe what, what weeds do is they increase shade and cover as all we all know, on, on a sunny day, you can always find a little cooler um, temperatures if you get in, in the shade under a tree, and I mean, it's no different in the weeds. So fish are able to find cooler temperatures than, than they would otherwise if, if they're exposed and not um, tucked into the weeds. The other thing is, so that's that the, the um, aquatic plants produce oxygen. So even though warmer waters can't hold as much oxygen, these plants are actually photosynthesizing and produce, producing oxygen. So the amount of oxygen that's in these waters will be like the maximum amount that those warmer waters can sustain. So they tend to have a bit of a bump up in, in oxygen. Sometimes you'd be super saturated just because of the uh, impact of the weeds photosynthesizing. And then with the, the, the speeding up of metabolism, um, you end up, weeds can have lots and lots of activity, lots of food for, for fish. So what, what happens is even though, this is the trade-off fish always have, is even though if they move into warmer waters, their metabolism speeds up. But if, if they can find enough food to overcome that and still you know, grow and, and get, get a sufficient growth rate, um, they, it, it's, it's a good strategy for them. And, and I think this is often you get your weed wall, uh, this is what they're doing. They get the oxygen from the aquatic plants, you've got your shade and cover, and they can also find enough food to, to make it worth their while. Um, however, in, in, in my experience, this does have limits for walleye. Um, I know that there's exceptions, but I, I've found that typically any, any walleye I've caught 
um, in my years of guiding that, that we're getting up close to 30 inches in length, getting up to like your 28 to 30 inch fish were almost without exception, always out on deeper water humps and, and deeper water where they don't have this. Sh and and in, the, in the weeds, I had always found that while I tend, tend to peak out at approximately 24 to 25 inches long, they get fairly quick growth rate, but it seems to peak. And, and I think that's just a factor of that warmer water their metabolism speeding up and as they get bigger they just can't find enough food to you know kind of grow larger than than about that 24 25 inches um, of length so the, the impacts of, of global warming um, and this is something that's um, We've been discussed quite a bit in, in particular when we talk about Clearwater Bay the, the western end of Lake of the Woods I think Whitefish Bay is in, in this manner blessed with some, some really, really deep water and, and some large deep basins. So this isn't as much of a factor, but any, any lake trout lake that has, you know, a, a limited amount of summer habitat, because um, lake, lake trout are, are a cold water fish. So they, they do, remember in, in that chart, so their um, metabolism and their oxygen level, they're, they're seeking out Colder, colder water. Um, and with some of our lake trout areas having limited areas with, with depths to support lake trout, it, it poses some challenge for them. If, if you can remember that graph with the hypolimni on that bottom and that there's no mixing of oxygen throughout the year. So what happens is, is as our summers get longer and, and it's, you know, and, and so that period where there is that thermal stratification and, and you've got that bottom layer isn't getting fresh oxygen um, it, as that goes longer and longer, the, the lake trout eventually, um, in some areas, are forced, you know, late, late summer to start to move up out of the, um, their comfort zone for, um, in, in the hypolimnion. It forces them into warmer waters. Um, they can find food there, but they just really need to seek out enough oxygen to, to survive. And, and what happens is that the fish typically don't die. You don't see uh, lake trout belly up in, 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 in the waters when, when this happens. Um, but what you do get is um, the, the fish when they become stressed, and this is typical of, of most fish species, but the, the females in particular will start to reabsorb their eggs. So what will happen is this is kind of a long term impact where all of a sudden fish stop reproducing because every, every year when they, when they need to they get stressed by having to move in shallower habitats and then their metabolism is moving too quickly and they're starting to lose weight they will reabsorb their eggs for energy and then will, will not end up re reproducing. So this is kind of how limnology can, can, can affect it. There's kind of a, in, well, there, there is an infographic here to show this. So again, remember if you've got your lake trouts living in, in the hypolimnia in there and you've got decomposition happening and using up oxygen and there is no fresh source of oxygen in, in that area in the summer months. So again, just put the longer our summers get, the, the, the more, um, impacts that, that that'll have on, on, on our lake trout. Uh, so yeah, so that's um, just in summary, um, just keeping in mind that, you know, it's important to, to learn about lakes because the fish are very sensitive to changes in their environment and, and lakes in this area are um, where, where the fish live, right? And understanding them and the seasonal patterns can help you to lo locate fish and, and find more fish. Um, and also species interactions um, can, related to temperature can impact where, where fish are found just in particular with our example of um, why crappie are where they are and in some parts of um, Lake of the Woods and other area lakes and just I mean global warming is can can have a real impact on our, our, our local fish species so in particular those cold water fish species like lake trout that are at the southern end of the range and I think like a lot of species um, terrestrial and aquatic that are at the southern end of the ranges. Um, global warming is yeah, a real a real threat to the to their survival. So with that, I will open up if anyone has any questions. And thank thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. I'm just going to unmute anybody if you have any questions. There we go. You're, you're able to unmute yourself. Um, 
if you have any questions, just uh, jump on in. Come on, there we go, finally worked. Um, I just wanna say thank you, Ryan, for doing this today. It was a really nice presentation. Looked good. I think I'm, hello, hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm technically challenged. <laughs> thank you very much for uh, the presentation. I really enjoyed it. I've uh, watched these presentations before and they always learn something and it's always interesting. So I have to thank you very much and look forward to more of them. Thank you. I think if there are no more questions, then I think we can wrap it up. Thank you so much, Ryan. It was really, really interesting. It gave me a lot to think about. And uh, yeah, we look forward to um, doing these on a larger scale next year. Looking forward to it. Okay. Thanks, Bye. everybody.